and he is Dr. Muhammad Ali Pate. He served as the Chief Executive Officer of Nigeria's National Primary Health Care Agency and was also a former Minister of State for Health in Nigeria between 20, 2011 and 2013. His work involved primary health care systems development, polio eradication, and routinization. He's also worked with the World Bank and sits on several committees and global panels. He is currently the Chief Executive Officer of Big Wind Philanthropy and an Adjunct Professor of Global Health at the Duke University of Global Health Institute in North Carolina. I also have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Ranjana Kumar, who is a pediatrician by training and has worked within the development and health sector for over two decades. She has the unique experience of working within governments, with civil society, with bilateral organizations, as well as the United Nations agencies at key decision-making and leadership levels. She has been working with Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance in Geneva for over a decade and was previously the regional head for Asia Pacific region. Currently, she leads the portfolio on building country capacity for leadership, management, and coordination. The third panelist that I would like to introduce is Dr. Posse Mugwenyi. Posse holds an international master's in health leadership and management from the McGill University in Montreal, Canada and he has more than 25 years of public health experience, is a medical doctor, and he started from the district level in his home country of Uganda as a district medical officer and rose to the level of the national EPI manager. He's also been the manager for the Center for Tobacco Control in Africa, and currently he serves as GSI's national technical director for Stronger Systems for Routinization at the Just Ended Maternal Child Survival Program. He works with GSI. We have two others uh, which we are uh, still trying to connect. Uh, at the point that they connect, I will be pleased to pause to introduce them. Uh, one is Professor Richard Adegbola as well as Dr. Margaret Antei, which we will be able to introduce at the point that they joined the, the webinar today. So I want to thank you for your attention in advance. Uh, we ask that if you are not speaking, that you mute yourself so that we can get the optimum um, audio quality. Uh, I'm going to ask our uh, distinguished panelists, I will um, facilitate you into the discussion um, by name. Uh, at that point, please unmute yourself and, and speak directly into your, into your microphone. So to get us started, we have a really big question uh, which we've asked the panelists to think about and share their thoughts with us today. And we'd like them to share with us their perspectives on why investing in health leadership is critical for achieving universal health coverage and immunization goals, particularly in Africa. To kick us off, I'm going to turn to uh, Professor Muhammad Ali Pate to share with us just briefly for a few minutes his, his initial perspectives and, and arguments in this direction. Uh, Professor Pate, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Folake and the JSI team for this opportunity to share some thoughts with you on the subject of leadership and why Africa, African health systems need stronger leadership. So the simple answer is that we have big problems. We have a huge gap between our aspiration and where we are. There are contending issues like the population dynamics on the continent, 
urbanization, technological changes, economic changes on the continent, as well as political changes. That's in the backdrop. And then we have still high mortality, morbidity, high fertility, background infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases, and a really generally poorer quality health system. Uh, health system quality is poor. So these are big issues that are the background. And then on the front end, we have a situation where political leaders have not prioritized health as well as they should, even if the citizens tend to prioritize health. When you see surveys, people prioritize health as what matters to them, but the political space is less prominent, leading to poor resources, weak institutions, and also, I would say, inadequately engaged uh, consumers or, or clients of the health system. These are the challenges that require leadership that is strong, competent to be able to bridge those gaps from where we are today and where we need to be. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for those initial thoughts, um, Professor Pate. You've really stimulated um, really deep thinking about the issues on, on health leadership. Um, I'm going to turn now to Dr. Um, Posse Mugengi um, and pose the same question to him. Uh, why health leadership is critical for achieving and sustaining uh, health development um, goals and achievements. Now, I believe he has a couple of slides for us. So we're going to put those on the screen um, as, he, as he shares his initial thoughts on this uh, critical issue. Um, Pasi, you have the floor. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Madreta, and uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to share our initial thoughts. First of all, it's very important to appreciate that the issue of leadership, management, and governance drives the health service agenda because it determines the funding priorities, it determines who should be appointed in the health care system and who should be promoted, and it also influences the ethics and the behavior of the health workers. Leaders and managers at all levels influence public opinion. Hence, it affects service uptake. It actually affects the demand for the services. And in addition to that, the structure of the government system and the access in determine policy and they control the supply chain. They determine the supply of logistics, which inputs go where, the frequency of the supplies, the quantities, the delivery levels, the availability of funds for the purchase of the supplies, and so on and so forth. On, on, on the other hand, leaders and who are, who are actually as political and civic leaders are in better position to demand accountability from both the health workers and the administrators, because you find that the, 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 the actors in the leadership management and governance, they have to be involved. They have to be engaged. They have to be protected in order to ensure that immunization services, in addition, just like any other services, is on their agenda. As Professor has rightly put it, the political leaders rarely prioritize health care. And unless they are engaged, they will do definitely not be in position to put health on the agenda, and this will definitely negatively impact on the demand and supply aspects of the, of, of, of the service delivery. If you can move to the next slide, uh, I will also expound on the fact that for successful EPI service delivery, there are three principal actors that are very key. These are policymakers, who are the political leaders and the civic leaders, they are the ones who determine what should be done with what resources. We also have the professionals, these are the health managers, the health workers, and we, last but not least, we have the population, these are the consumers. And as the Professor said again, there have been inadequate engagement of the consumers, and I think it is very important to recognize that component. Therefore, leadership management and governance actors influence all the three players I have mentioned above. Therefore, if we have positive intervention to strengthen leadership and management, it will have exponential effects on the service delivery at the end of the day. 
policy makers, who are the political leaders, who are the administrators, the professionals, who are the managers and health workers, they need to be engaged, they need to plan and monitor the services together in order to leverage the strengths of each of the three groups. Health facility directors, they play an important role, not just in management, but also in leadership. They can play catalytic roles, even with limited resources, and also in terms of reaching out beyond the health sector, because we know health funding in Africa is not enough. So we must empower them to find additional resources on top of health funding from within the health sector, but also from without, in order to fill the gaps that the health budget we have provided. And last slide, if you can turn to the last slide, I will also attempt to answer the question of why are we talking about the subnational leadership management and governance? In Africa and most countries, we have a decentralization system. Districts and lower level government structures are responsible for service delivery. The central government does the policy and standards. They are closer to the consumers of the health services Hence, so they can do better to monitor the quality and the reach of the services. They are the implementers of health programs, in other words. In addition, lower level local government actors understand the community well. They, under, they understand the context better. Most times, they also participate in consuming the service. If good or bad, they are in a better position to know. Local government actors, they have power to allocate additional resources to health programs supplement PHC grants, and also to solicit for additional funds. The actors also have power to make bylaws to promote health, which are relevant to the local context, and to ensure that those bylaws are implemented. Local government actors, in addition to that, they, 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 in the lower level, they determine the health outcomes because they control the demand of the consumers since they are community gatekeepers, and they form the last peg of the supply chain. So in other words, they control both supply and the demand side of the, of the chain. They determine the success of the last mile, as we call it. And lastly, engaging them through their own participation and involvement, in engaging them to participate in planning at inception stage, both micro planning, mapping, quarter review meetings, and monitoring quality of care, sharing information and being transparent with them about the budgets and challenges, and making EPI their agenda item in every aspect they partake is very critical if we are going to impact on health service delivery. For now, I thank you. Wanda, thank you very much, uh, Posse, for those um, perspectives. And you really were able to elaborate on the issue of not just national uh, leadership, but also uh, subnational and at the, at the local levels. Uh, thank you for sharing those perspectives. I'm going to turn now to uh, Dr. Ranjana Kumar. Um, uh, Ranjana, you sit at the global level, and your your portfolio looks across uh, leadership, uh, management, and uh, issues, um, particularly in the low middle income countries. Can you share your view on why investing in health leadership is critical for achieving uh, the the set global goals. Over to you, Ranjana. Uh, mentioned by the previous speakers, uh, we have seen time and again the power of transformative leadership which changed countries for the better. And I'm going back in history here because we have seen that at a political level during our wars of independence a long time ago, several such leaders really transformed the continent. And uh, the first leader which comes to mind is uh, Dr. Nelson Mandela, who actually happened to be the first chair of the Gavi board. So we have seen the power of this transformational leadership. Now coming down to an operational level, more programmatic level, we have seen that leaders have embraced new ideas and have invested heavily in their workforce, in the systems, and related structure to bring about these transformational changes. And Dr. Pate here, who's um, also one of the speakers during his, uh, his tenure uh, of the leadership, 
uh, we have seen that the polio program really made uh, big strides. And this was not only because dollar resources were poured in, but it is also to do with leadership and investing in people and getting routine systems in place. Now on the flip side of the coin, we can see that we have seen that in all these Gavi uh, eligible uh, countries, particularly low income countries, that a lack of leadership results in underperformance. Underperformance of the public sector program in their commitments and um, their assurances on what they would like to achieve. And hence, the performance has been, the outcomes have been less than uh, optimal. Uh, and in the immunization sector, this has resulted in stagnation of coverage and equity in immunization and inability to reach every child. So really inability to deliver on the promise of reaching every child. Now if I look at universal health coverage, it's not only the technical strategies which will be enough, but really we need to uh, support uh, countries in the execution of the program and in management, managing these programs. And um, in, uh, la in May 2017, the World Health Assembly urged member states to strengthen the governance and leadership of national immunization program as without that strong leadership and management capacities, the Global Vaccine Action Plan strategy cannot be implemented, properly implemented and sustained. So we really have a, a commitment to invest in leadership and management from all the countries who are, uh, uh, who are members, uh, who are WHO member states. Now, Gary fully agrees with this view and hence in the last strategic period, we have started to invest more deliberately in country leadership and capacity. And last year when we um, conducted a survey to identify the technical needs uh, and support requirements for, for EPI managers, uh, support to LMC or leadership management and uh, coordination came as one of the top priorities. So this actually came from the countries, which sort of demonstrated that um, uh, countries have now started giving equal importance uh, to governance of the program, leadership of the program, and actually management and execution of the program. And I'm glad to say that in um, to date, uh, almost 36 countries have requested for the support and over two thirds of them come from the African continent. So I'll stop here and then we can uh, look at the details as we go along. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ranjana. You brought up issues around um, the, the, the lack of uh, results and underperformance and you how that links with uh, leadership or the lack of leadership. And, you know, the point that you raised of uh, looking at uh, technical um, expertise and elevating the, the role of leadership and management, I think it's a critical pivot in, in, the, in the development and health uh, space. So thank you for sharing those perspectives. I'm going to turn uh, back to um, Professor uh, Pate. In your, your tenure as the Minister, the minister of State for Health in, in Nigeria, you, you were instrumental in, in strengthening the, the leadership, uh, particularly around polio, immunization, primary health care, and advancing issues around um, maternal and, and child health. Now, from your perspective, what are the challenges to strengthen African health leadership. Um, we, we fully, uh, in our first round of uh, contributions, have acknowledged the importance. But what are the challenges in making sure that uh, health leadership and governance is strong from your perspective? Over to you, uh, Professor Pate. Thank you. I, I think, um, let me just reflect just a minute on the 
the concept that was uh, alluded to earlier in terms of uh, managers and leaders. I think that's all uh, widely acknowledged, uh, but I take the position that uh, managers get appointed and promoted and leaders act in a way to distinguish the position from actually exercising leadership, in which case at every level people can exercise leadership. And if we define it as making things happen, making the right things happen. So in terms of uh, specifically your question, I think the, 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 the insufficient numbers of um, people in position to exercise leadership who have both the depth and the breadth so you need a technical um, expertise in the field to understand the issues, but you also need to um, have the breadth. I had mentioned earlier the dualism that we face in the health sector, whereby uh, it's a priority for the people, but it's not a priority for the political leaders. That translates into lack of resources. So leaders who are able to uh, speak the language of economics and finance and speak and understand what the politicians are talking about and also connect technically to the issue. I think we have um, a gap in terms of sufficient numbers of people. Secondly, I think the, 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 the institutional um, to build, to enable those who are identified to have those attributes that I uh, mentioned in terms of being uh, both depth and breadth, the institutions themselves have to be strengthened. Institutional capacity has to be built such that they're able to execute on the vision and all the things that they would need to do to achieve the outcomes. Um, if we have lots of fragmentation or we have really a system that thrives on weak institutional capacity, really not much will happen. But building the institution in terms of uh, policies, procedures, but also with capable hands beneath them or within their teams will enable them to lead institutions that would be efficient, so minimize waste, deal with um, the effectiveness of those institutions, achieve what they are supposed to achieve, and pay attention to quality, not only in the work that they do, but overall in the health system which they drive, because that's a huge issue that we have. Um, then we also then would, with stronger institutions, then we would not see a situation whereby initiative works and when over time based on the personality so that the institution are able to take on and continue to build on uh, 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 on, 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 on efforts to improve at whatever level, whether it's at the uh, subnational level or at the national level. And I think uh, bilingual leaders who are able to, when I say bilingual, I mean they're able to speak both technically but also to a broader audience, are better able to communicate, uh, to engage with their communities, not only at the local level but also broader community because that sort of, the health space, it's not just driven by health people. So it's a, there are several others that, that leaders will have to influence to achieve the outcomes that we're looking for, whether better resources that are allocated or use of the resources or behaviors of people within organizations, uh, or changing systems of how things are delivered. So those are the uh, the, the, uh, uh, the thoughts that I, I would like to put here. Thank you so so much. I I think you know the the concept of dualization is it's it's really critical. And you know, do we actually have manager leaders and leader managers? Um, and, and I think really. How are we equipping um, Africa to be able to where you know play this dual role? Um, so many things uh, that you've raised there. I'm going to ask Posse, you know, for his thoughts on this. And Professor Pate, you you raised the issue of uh, it's not only health uh, uh, persons that are involved in in health leadership and health decisions. So I'm going to ask um, um, Posse. Uh, what are his thoughts on on this as non health uh, uh, people who are who influence uh, health leadership and and decisions? Uh, can you share some some thoughts on on that as well? Posse, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, it's true. I can share some experience. 
uh, one uh, from my experience working both at national level and uh, at the district level and with these projects, the two projects we have been implementing at GSI, working up, up to the health facility level, which is very, very clear that the, the non-health uh, actors are very critical uh, to ensure that the health workers, the health professionals do their job because by, the, by appointment, by training, by job description, by job specification, the health workers, there are certain things which are beyond their, their, their reach. For instance, when it comes to uh, advocating for budget increase, advocating for additional resources, the health workers are not well equipped in terms of lobbying skills. They are not well equipped in terms of uh, uh, networking to, to communicate effectively, to move the district councils, to move the sub-county councils, to put health as a priority because most political leaders, they look at the physical things, they look at construction of a health center, to be, for instance, more important than, uh, than uh, changing behavior of people to reduce HIV AIDS prevalence or to increase immunization coverage. So the, the issue of uh, the scope of the health workers, they need the non-health stakeholders because they, they are, for them, they are more, they, have a, they are in a better position to uh, leverage, to advocate for more resources, to advocate for uh, more personnel, for instance, when the infrastructure is not enough. So in terms of advocacy, we need the non-health stakeholders. In terms of additional resources, in terms of networking, you need the non-health stakeholders. But also, when it comes to demanding for accountability, health workers being the implementers, it's difficult for them to check themselves, to monitor themselves. Uh, so you need the non-health stakeholders to actually uh, participate in monitoring the quality of care, to demand for good quality of care, to demand for value for money, better use of the resources, to ensure that there is no inequities, because it is very easy for a health facility, for instance, to forget a particular community and they completely ignore them. So to look for communities that are left out, that is the, the, where a non health stakeholders. The examples are many, but in the interest of, of the panelists, that's what I can quickly say in these few minutes. Thank you so much, um, Pasi. You know, we've been uh, discussing the issue of uh, health uh, leadership and governance and um, why this is important. We've talked about some of the, the challenges um, and the, you know, at the, at national, but also as a national. So in your view, what would you say are some of the enabling factors um, that makes for strong uh, health leadership? And, and maybe on the other side of that, what, what would be the measure to say now we have managers who, 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 who can act, who, who can take the right decision and act appropriately to drive and achieve expected uh, results? Um, what what would that metric be? Um, so I, I put these two questions on the table. Um, I'm I'm opening the floor uh, to all three of our current panelists, but um, I'd like to perhaps hear from uh, Ranjana in terms of you know what would you say um, are enabling factors as you work across multiple countries uh, strengthening uh, leadership and, and your investment. Now, what, what, what was the metrics that would say this is a strong leadership that can drive um, the, the country forward? Thanks, Polake. Uh, I'm using this to even uh, probably uh, put on table a couple of thoughts on the challenges also in the African health leaders face from a global perspective. So if you permit, may I? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I mean, the previous speakers, I fully agree with them. Uh, but I think from this global uh, perspective, from where uh, I sit, what we see, the other challenges that African um, health leaders face is, uh, one is um, some situation of conflict. Uh, and volatility. So there are these uh, couple of countries like the Central African Republic, uh, uh, Liberia is post-conflict now. 
uh, Chad is there. So in some countries, uh, it takes a lot of, um, uh, you know, the uh, budget to deal with those issues. So there are competing prior, much more competing priorities um, uh, for the budget allocation. The second thing we see is also um, disease outbreaks. So we've seen that. Uh, as the systems start to be uh, in place, uh, if there is a disease outbreak like we saw in Ebola, in Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone, uh, recently in DRC, uh, then again the whole health system is thrown off gear. So, um, uh, uh, so these challenges, uh, I just wanted to put it on the table in addition to what Dr. Pate and uh, Dr. Posty has already mentioned. Coming uh, to the enabling factors for strong uh, public health uh, leadership and the metrics for defining progress, we have actually um, seen that, you know, you do what you measure. So if you're those countries whose metrics are in place, because all countries, you know, they have a vision and they already know what they want to do it. But if we keep an eye on the metrics, on what is it that we want to achieve, then the whole system is geared towards performing uh, in uh, those areas. For example, I'll just illustrate it with an example. You know, a recently sort of in um, uh, DRC, uh, for um, uh, example, there were because of all these disease outbreaks, they, they um, instituted the Mashako plan uh, to increase immunization coverage, um, you know, in priority uh, districts. And what we have seen is, if you keep very simple metrics, for example, and I'm not simplifying it too much just for an illustration, but just to say that this is sort of working, which is that, um, you know, are the vaccines available or not? Is the cold chain functional or not? What about the supervision at the provincial level or the health zone level? Are the immunization sessions being held at the session site? Now, these are just four or five simple metrics. I mean, there are lots of it, but I'm just prioritizing these four or five. And uh, uh, creating a dashboard at the national and provincial level to see whether this is working or not. And what we have seen is that really in, within a year, there is a rapid improvement in uh, conduct of the immunization sessions, the vaccine availability, the cold chain functionality, because these are all followed by management action. So when you asked about the enabling environment, I think the leaders, should really provide a platform to the managers to act on key areas that um, are important. Uh, and again, as I said, have absolutely a vision of investing in people, investing in the workforce and strengthening the system. I'll stop there. Posse or Professor Pate, would you like to uh, yeah. chime in? Yes. It's a so uh, let, let me just um, uh, tell a small uh, story. I think, Folaki, you remember this uh, 10 years ago in Nigeria, as part of our work to introduce new vaccines, we realized that leadership competences were lacking at the sub-national level. Uh, there were several leaders who, who were in positions of leadership, but effectively uh, were administrators, and they had not had either the training or the skills to lead teams to really uh, deliver on the system improvement that we needed in order to convince Gavin and others to um, approve new vaccines for Nigeria. So th this is a very, how do I say, it? it's very prevalent. And when you ask what are those metrics, how do you identify that, I would say um, both at the, at the national level, for instance, um, I, I think there should be the the metric would be whether there is a coherent vision as to where the health system improvement or immunization improvement is actually going to be, and being able to communicate that or being communicated widely. Uh, so that coherent vision and its communication. 
whether there is a, a, a they can speak to a strategy that has been articulated to achieve that uh, 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 vision or goal that has been set. Uh, whether they have uh, teams to be able to execute on that. There's a demonstration of the leadership competencies where they're able to articulate and convene a multi-sectoral team or cross-functional team that is able to execute on that. Uh, whether they're able to foster learning and growth within that uh, uh, institution or wherever they are placed in terms of the people around them, but also within the system that they are managing, such that the implicit knowledge that is out there uh, in an iterative manner, people implement, but also learn and grow through, through it, and they foster that. Uh, where they have accountability mechanisms that they put in place and are uh, visible. At the subnational level, obviously, it's to a lesser extent, but are they able to, trans to, to speak to this? An example I saw was in Ethiopia, where um, at some point I, we spoke to the national government, we went to the Wareda level and Kebele level. And remarkably consistent um, uh, narrative emerged at all of those levels because everybody understood what the vision was, what the strategy was, what they are working towards, and how they are working towards as a team, and the accountability. And there's a remarkable consistency across all levels. Now, that's to me exemplifying a system where there was a semblance of good leadership. And I think that's um, that's key to the improvements that we're looking for. Now, the managerial competencies, uh, we can train people, we can deploy them, we can incentivize them, um, and that's important as well. But for the change that we want, not the status quo, for maintaining the current system as it is, for writing the reports, for doing the budget and spending the money, accounting for it, that's managerial function. And that, of course, can be improved. Uh, but for the transformation that we're looking for in the continent, given all the problems that I had mentioned, uh, the backlog of mobility and mortality issues that we have, the new circumstances that we're facing um, on the continent, even in immunization, the new vaccines that will be coming down the pike and how to deal with them, we need to be able to upscale that leadership and leadership competency across multiple uh, missions through leaders who have both depth but also breadth and are able to, to manifest them through those attributes that I have uh, mentioned. So I'll stop here. I'd like to, to, um, to be a little bit controversial, um, Dr. Patti. Um, one of your uh, major initiatives um, in Nigeria was really bold. And you, you initiated a program that was focused on outcomes and metrics. Um, and that was the Saving One Million Lives. It was a, one of the boldest initiatives in, in the Nigeria health sector. Can, I mean, can you share what, what in your view, um, was, the, was the driver behind that? Yes. Um, and, and how you were able to, to actually mobilize the whole country towards uh, this type of um, goal? Thank you. So I think um, really the, the, the central issue that we tried to address with saving women was really to shift people's thinking from thinking primarily based on inputs to thinking focused on the outcomes that matter. Because uh, when I was earlier in my tenure, I realized that a lot of people still thought in terms of um, buildings constructed, things procured, uh, trainings conducted, and the client and the outcomes were further away from what people are spending most of their time. And I realized that we could do that, and it would be very inefficient, and we would not achieve the results. So the articulation of Saving One Million were really to really focus everyone on the results that matter, build our priorities based on the lives saved, uh, which maternal and child health, vaccine preventable diseases, malnutrition, basic ailments like malaria and pneumonia uh, uh, came out as sort of the, 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 the core areas. And then walk backwards to the constraints and institutionalizing ways of measuring, but also accountability through dashboards, uh, such that the Nigerian health system will now be closer in terms of holding actors accountable. 
This was in anticipation of the National Health Act and the Basic Services Fund. We thought that if we had saving one million lives and um, we mobilized one and we mobilized almost a billion dollars, the idea is that when the Health Act uh, comes into being, the, at that time it was the health bill, the Basic Services Fund will not go towards just financing inputs, that it has a model that it can follow. Because the worst thing that will happen for Nigeria is to spend billions of naira on uh, stuff and realize that it's still lagging behind in terms of outcomes uh, that matter, and we could do it very well. So we didn't want to follow that um, route, and we thought the saving one million lives could be a, a forerunner, so to speak, of a results-based uh, approach within the Nigerian health system that brings in the federal government, the state government, uh, the local government, the state primary health care agencies, because by then we had the primary health care under one roof. Uh, so really it was... Uh, uh, it's, it's really from the lens of governance in health and trying to focus on results and focus on accountability and focus on data and how that changes the health system because focusing only on the inputs alone will not lead us to where we need to be. You need both to look at the input but importantly to have a clear focus on the outcomes but that has to be done with uh, data and the last few years I think Nigeria has moved forward in terms of data the various surveys that have been conducted I think we now have a better feel that we are now able to talk about Nigerian health system in more concrete terms with some good quality data still to um, improve but at least uh, move that agenda a bit forward and I think to the credit of those who are there now the minister and others they've continued to build on that path so that's the other thing uh, we're fortunate that who had people who then are trying to uh, build on that. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Pate. Now, um, Pate, I'm going to ask you, um, you, you started to raise the issue of um, non-health stakeholders also hold um, the, the health uh, leadership um, accountable. Um, and just before I come to you, I'd like to, I mean, I'd like you to think uh, about this question. Um, so who holds, um, apart from the non-health stakeholders, who, who else holds the health leaders accountable? Uh, just before you respond to that, I'd like to take a question from uh, our audience and our participants. I have a question from the online chat box. So at this point, I'm going to encourage you, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat box. So we'll be taking them periodically throughout the, the webinar. So this question is from Joshua Kashitala. And his question is, is it possible to introduce recruitment criteria for leaders in health institutions and sub-national levels? Uh, so I, w I would like um, Dr. Pasi to start off with the first question. <clears throat> Who holds the health leaders accountable? And also take on this question about introducing uh, leadership as part of the recruitment criteria for health institutions. Over to you. Thank Martin. you. Thank you, uh, moderator. I just wanted to make a quick addition to what uh, my colleagues have been talking about on uh, successful leaders. The enabling factor, I just want to add one point that the question of innovativeness is very paramount. The system must be allowing innovation and the health managers, the actors, the leaders must also be uh, looking out for innovation, always think outside the box. Otherwise, when you find a system which is clogged and they are just implementing business as usual, you cannot achieve much. But to this question, the health leaders, the system of decentralization or uh, the provincial system of governance that we have in most of these African countries, uh, create governance structures at the regional level and the district level and lower levels. And they put the health managers directly under the supervision of the provincial or the district administrators. But the challenge is the district administrators, the provincial people, uh, they do not have the, 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 the expertise to actually do technical uh, supervision and holding them accountable. You cannot achieve it if we look at the performance, the output. The, as my colleague has said, 
said the output at the end of the result, not per se looking at the input and your satisfied. So as far as holding the heritage leaders accountable, the political leaders who are put in position by the population, they are accountable to the population. And in Africa, populations are waking up. You, when you see the changes in the political arena, those changes are not only limited to the political arena. They are only coming, they are delivery. So the, we have high interest levels, we have internet, people check, they know what they are entitled to, so they know what should be done, and therefore we do not have a so ignorance, which is in the data. Therefore, the population put the leaders accountable, the technical people accountable. And at the end of the day, you have a, a, a company. you don't immunize the children, the leaders are to break, the population will punish the political leaders. And the political leaders also make sure that the health workers have the necessary logistics and tools to do their job, to do they deliver. The second and most important part is putting in place a mechanism for performance monitoring. Some of the districts in Uganda, for instance, have come up with innovation of signing performance contracts for the health managers at subnational level, such as that a health manager who takes up a responsibility for being the director of a health facility, he signs up certain performance levels. So, hold this person accountable as per the expected uh, output in the performance contract. But in the performance contract, necessary uh, input which the health director needs in order to do So it is kind of it, it, it is kind of the two way. But the health workers they must deliver because they, they, they are monitored by the political leaders, and at the same time the political leaders demand for input timely inputs in terms of vaccines and gas and the transport to do their job. So when both each one plays their role, you find they, they are delivering. Now the last question is introducing re recruitment criteria for health managers. The answer is yes and no. Uh, the training of health managers essentially is based on medical knowledge. Your ability to interpret the medical problems of the population diagnose them, manage them. Now, the medical training lacks a component of all this we are talking about. There is very little in the medical school you will cover under leadership, unless you go for case, that's when you do some little of it. So, yes, we could introduce it for recruitment, but I think the first thing is to introduce it at pre service training so that people finish the training schools when they know something about leadership and management, and they, when you go to the field and appointed medical directors of these medical institutions and districts and, 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 and health districts, they already have a good dose of what a health manager and a health leader is at level. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, Posse. Um, I think your last point uh, about introducing this into the pre-service uh, curriculum, uh, leadership, um, skilled leadership, uh, practical leadership, um, is something that uh, Joshua Kashitala also um, suggested as, as part of his uh, contribution in, in the chat box. So thank you so much, uh, Joshua, for those comments. I'd like to encourage all the others to keep your questions coming. Uh, your comments will be um, uh, picking them up uh, as we go on the, the webinar. Um, at this point, well, I, yes, yeah. please. So just wanted to, because you had uh, mentioned that we could respond on this, I, I yes. have a small contribution to make. I think on the accountability bit, I think there are two elements to it, the sort of the answerability and the consequence of whether good or bad uh, the, uh, in terms of the actors in the health system, and to link that to the availability of data. To say we are going to hold people accountable in the health system without really good systems for collecting data as to what is really happening, it's fiction. Uh, I think we need to acknowledge that and to link the data and 
uh, ability to all people to answer for what is going right or not right, and also having some consequence with the legal or political consequences. I think um, ideally, if we can say African heads of states or, um, uh, or ministers or chief executives of provincial level or states have some metric of um, uh, how their health systems are doing, say health system quality, if they have two, three indicators, for instance, even if it's just patient satisfaction or something like that, that is uh, that can be reliable. I'm not saying that particular metric, but some indication of what their uh, population is actually uh, experiencing from the health system. I think that would shape the behavior of the actors uh, in a way that they would improve and they would be providing leadership, but they will be holding also uh, people to account because they will need to provide the resources and the direction, but they can be able to hold people to account. And then the public will have some objective basis of weighing one versus the other. For instance, if we have a government uh, in Africa that actually loses an election because it's failed in <laughs> health or immunization or some outbreak, I think that would be a very good um, uh, development. But I think we are not yet there, but that's sort of where we should be going. And in terms of recruitment, I, I think I just, uh, in addition to what Posse mentioned, uh, I think we should look carefully at leadership competency when we are recruiting or appointing, not just the technical skills, like it said. Uh, so not also just the explication of, okay, what leadership is, but to assess the leadership, the competency, whether they're, they're good team players. You can have very well-educated persons, uh, but they're, they're not really able to play uh, constructive roles within teams, or they're not able to communicate very well, uh, or they have no really vision where they will take their system, even if it's at the local level. And so to put that, I think that would be uh, very key. And then finally, one of the things that we are, we, we, we um, coaching, some of this are not amenable to just classroom or school-based, but coaching and mentoring, uh, there's a dearth of that. I think many young people uh, many uh, young managers, what they need is um, good coaches and mentors. Uh, I benefited immensely when I was in, in office by creating uh, a network of what I will say, uh, coaches and even peer mentors that I could reflect on my experiences and think about what I, we are trying to do and get constructive feedback from people who are not um, engaged in it. And that helped sharpen my understanding of the problems and how to execute it and get help where I need it. Uh, because it, uh, at least at, a, at, the high, at the national level, it can become very lonely because everyone has interests and all of that. But you need to have avenues uh, for leaders who are growing to have coaches and mentors. Uh, that is not in this classroom or in the school. It's not about a certificate. But I think it's very, it can be very, very useful. Yeah. Sounds okay. So, Professor Pate, you, you've really raised the bar on this one. Um, and, you know, um, in, in terms of, of being able to have uh, leadership competencies and, and people who can, who can act and, and, and take, uh, achieve results, um, but also you've, you've raised the issue around um, having a network of, of practical um, coaches and, and mentors, you know, that, that can provide a sounding board um, and bring up the best ideas and, and, and support you know, for implementing and acting. I think for me, one big um, uh, takeaway that's come up to the top is, you know, leaders act. And I think that's really acting the best interests of, of their people and the health system. And uh, I think, you know, really um, ensuring that we have leaders in health leadership in Africa that can can do this is is, is going to be definitely outside of the classroom. Um, in terms of uh, pre-service, I think there's there's general uh, support for that. But in addition, um, outside on the job mentoring and and coaching. Um, this this takes me to some of the work that Ranjana that you are doing, and that is uh, providing technical assistance to to countries to strengthen uh, their health leadership and management and coordination abilities. And uh, you've been doing this with a, with a very good focus on, on Africa. So 
in your view, what are the ways that you think there can be a, a better coordination between uh, technical uh, knowledge and competencies and uh, leadership expertise? How, how can we better streamline this? Um, and how can uh, stakeholders um, really help to, to build bridges uh, between these two areas? Over to you, Ranjana. Thanks a lot, Palaki. So I, I think this is a very important question because it's literally, as Dr. Pate said, it's simply that managers or leaders, they should have the breadth, the depth and the breadth of understanding of the issue that they're dealing with. And we have seen that um, uh, usually the standard managers are who, are who are there at the local level, they're technically sound. But they, are, they give uh, primary importance to their technical knowledge in, and getting that right rather than the programmatic management um, skills. And what we have seen is that, um, uh, you know, these, I mentioned that now 36 countries have uh, requested for support and there's ongoing implementation of these support. And much of it on principle is really closer to the country. It's embedded in the EPI department or in the ministry on a longer term basis, minimum two years, because this is, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. You cannot develop the leadership and management um, uh, qualities overnight. So we have to have patience and see that, uh, uh, you know, the leaders and managers are continuously supported. So actually, as Dr. Pate mentioned, that one of the principles that of support is that really there is a peer coach uh, sort of embedded in the ministry on a longer term basis and helps them to say, um, you know, help them broaden their um, um, scope, their outlook on how to manage the program, how to execute it, and how to measure results. The other thing also we have seen, at the meeting of the technical and um, uh, leadership qualities is through uh, various governance mechanisms whether it's the district task force galvanizing it and making it act or the provincial task forces at the national level any decision making um, you know body that you have just to see that um, you know the agendas are in place the membership is in place uh, you're not uh, the discussions are in such a manner that you're actually taking decisions and then following through on the actions so, uh, so these are some of the simple ways that we have seen is um, actually help uh, move the needle. But as I, uh, as I said, it will be a longer term approach before you can uh, really measure the outcome and the results. The, one of the other innovative approaches we have seen in meeting the technical and uh, leadership uh, qualities, streamlining them together, is in South-to-South -South, South -South collaboration. And it's not only transfer of knowledge uh, and skills of technical areas, but also management capacities and policy development. And even advocating what I was hearing uh, previous speakers say is that what should be good leadership qualities, you know, advocating for resources, supporting your own staff. So all that is also possible in South to South collaboration. And we have an example in uh, Asia where Sri Lanka is one of the, uh, you know, one of the leading countries uh, in their systems, their health systems goes. And mind you, Sri Lanka is still a lower or a lower, uh, lower income country, uh, but their resource allocation, their systems, et cetera, can compare with one of the stronger middle income countries or even um, developed countries. And they have partnered with Timor Less, which is, a new nation, just 20 years old, emerging from conflict and war, uh, and there is a longer-term partnership to uh, build those skills, and not only technical knowledge, but also the other qualities. I'll stop here. 
Thank you so much, Rinjana. I think you you really elaborated the the issue of the fast changing context, uh, even in terms of uh, leading within an area of uh, conflict or 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 change of uh, humanitarian crisis. Um, and we know that you cannot separate these issues or natural disasters. Uh, we're all aware of the the flooding uh, within uh, our our countries in. Um, Zimbabwe and Malawi and um, Mozambique um, and and the devastation there. Um, we we're also aware of the conflict uh, that's that in, in several of the countries, uh, which makes health leadership require a, a new set of skills. Um, so as as we go along this discussion, uh, let's think of ways that at how we can ensure that uh, health leaders in Africa are nimble and flexible. Uh, to be able to adapt and 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 thoroughly understand uh, changes and decisions that that need to be made in a in sometimes a a fast changing um, uh, environment. I'm going to ask about um, the private sector. Um, Professor Adebola is is not able to to join us, um, but he has worked with the private sector uh, for some time, and I'd like to perhaps. Um, leave this open um, in terms of what role do you think the, the private sector has to play in, in health leadership, if any at all? Uh, feel free to, to share your comments on, on this. I think for like a, the, it, I mean, leadership, regardless of public or private sector, I think embodies the same, uh, let's say, attributes. Um, within the context of countries, there are certain things that the private sector is perhaps better able to do. So leaders in the private sector can have more flexibility to be innovative, uh, to test new ideas, um, to, uh, com uh, to to convene resources that may be different from what the public sector might have. And, and perhaps uh, there are practices uh, the, 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 that the, the private sector um, has shown in that people in the public sector can learn from. There are some technical areas uh, like logistics and supply chain and some understanding of that, say uh, inventory management for vaccines or for primary health care drugs. I remember in Nigeria for a very long time, uh, we did not really have an inventory model for uh, vaccine logistics until when we got uh, some private sector ideas to look at it and just reorganizing how we handled that at least for vaccines helped in two states improve uh, coverage within the same uh, volume of vaccines that we were receiving. So those kinds of um, uh, competences that are out in the private can be brought in. But again, it requires leaders that are able to be bilingual or multilingual to understand the, the one, one side and the other, either private sector, public sector, or within the health sector itself, health technical and also things like economics, financing, and understand various people's language. Those leaders are the, are the ones that are more likely, I think, to be um, effective in driving the change that we need to see for health outcomes of health system to improve their performance. I'm really intrigued with the with the um, multilingual approach um, in terms of health leadership being able to understand finances, economics, uh, and actually also have a depth of the technical issues. Um, and how there can be a, a learning and sharing uh, from the from the private sector, I'm I'm going to pick a question from the chat box that I think it's it's really interesting, and this is um, uh, the the question is asking how do we currently access um, what in country governance capacities and incentive structures exist to enable the use of innovations? So for me, this is a uh, focus around the use of technological innovation in health leadership. Um, and so what, what are the, what are the, the incentives for, um, for using 
technology uh, innovations to to enhance and improve in-country governance capacities. Um, I will perhaps um, direct that to uh, Dr. Passi at this point, and uh, maybe Ranjana, if you if you'd like to to chip in. Uh, thank you. Uh, before I share that, I want to make a small uh, addition to the issue of private sector. I think the private sector has a lot of potential uh, to support uh, health programs like immunization, provided the managers, the health managers and leaders, they know how to harness the capabilities in the private sector. For instance, all the companies, most of the companies, at the country level have corporate social responsibility and they are how to support any programs. I remember when I was in the EPI program, we worked with the uh, Coca-Cola to give us freezing facilities during the polio campaigns and they were very happy to do that at no cost. And uh, we have seen in the recent projects, we have seen circles, community circles who come forward to provide, uh, like to buy a motorcycle for uh, conducting outreaches where they find their constraints of transport, they provide that one and they consider that one as a corporate social responsibility. So it needs a, a manager who has the, the lenses to see the potential around himself or herself and be able to tap into those potentials and pick it and, and apply it. I think there's a lot of potential which can be uh, the, uh, uh, taken uh, interest of. Now, what about uh, the, the, the innovations? What are the in-country innovations, uh, uh, incentives for using technology? Now, uh, it's uh, very important to know that uh, if the people at the country level, they have been uh, thrust into that mode of wanting to uh, achieve, they will look out for any opportunity. For instance, uh, we have a very big problem of conducting national meetings. And uh, you find that we spend a lot of money to collect people from the districts to come for a one-day meeting. Lots of resources. The district officer comes, travels with the driver, and, uh, and you find three officers come. You find all the vehicles are at the national level, and you spend lots and lots of money. Whereas if they were... Uh, these meetings are held online. You would find that you cut lots of costs and the, and the inconvenience of uh, having to correct people all the, from all the districts to national levels. There are facilities now which are aiding supportive supervision, uh, which WHO is using in the country uh, to, 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 uh, to, to show that actually you have gone for a facility, you have done supportive supervision, and there is evidence to that effect. And you can submit a report uh, uh, so I think the, uh, if the, the leadership is, is, is in the habit of wanting to deliver the, 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 the service, they look around for any potential benefit, any, any potential of the appliers or technology that can help them. And uh, if they, it is applied, it would do one, reduce the cost, improve uh, efficiency, and, uh, and, uh, and probably uh, be more efficient. So I think there is a, it, it only takes the health manager or the leader to have the lenses to see the potential that is available and also to be able to think outside the box. Because if the leaders want to do things the way they have done it in the past and continue to do it, they are not able to see the opportunities. But if leaders can put on lenses of innovation and thinking outside the box, they look at any opportunity around, they deploy, you find that technology can actually be very useful in improving efficiency. Thanks a lot. Uh, maybe I'll go um, straight in after this. Uh, you know, this is the 21st century, and we have to really capitalize on, uh, you know, the uh, digital world which is there and many other innovations which really expand the horizons of your thinking. And what we have seen in the Gavi world is some simple technologies which, which help improve uh, your management. For example, uh, simple technology of uh, data management, but digitally, 
whether it's um, vaccine uh, inflow, outflow uh, from primary health uh, clinics to right at the national level, if everything is connected, it's, it's a way to see um, whether your, uh, um, you know, it improves your inventory management, your stock management, and um, um, waste, wasting of resources, because those which are expiring sooner can be really expended sooner. Other way of innovative this thing is temperature control for cold chain equipment. And we have seen in a large country like India, where this has been now taken to scale in so many provinces, we have seen the, we have saved uh, on a lot of costs from vaccine expiry and uh, wastage. Uh, I think the other way uh, what we have seen in several countries in Africa is actually using the digital tools. Uh, I mean, Dr. Posse mentioned about um, conferences. We've actually using a blended approach for online training as well as face-to-face -face training, actually on leadership management, <laughs> and uh, which, has, which is really popular. Uh, and now uh, in Gavi, what we find is that these courses are really oversubscribed. So people are making more use of uh, innovations and uh, uh, you know, using them. There is another innovation we have seen is um, uh, delivery of, um, I mean, this is in Rwanda, which is a happening of uh, blood products through drones. So in those areas where previously there was no, um, uh, very difficult to deliver um, commodities, whether vaccines or other drugs, now drones are actually helping uh, to do that. So I think this really helps leaders uh, to better understand what is happening out there and use the technologies and the innovations to drive progress and results. Salaki? Uh, thank you so much, um, Ranjana, for for bringing up the, those points in terms of how innovations can in, increase uh, management efficiencies and improve uh, decision making and the evidence, um, ensuring that that is uh, on hand. Um, it's interesting that you you brought up the the point of uh, the the technology around drones. I was actually in uh, Rwanda a few months ago and had the the privilege of seeing the the drones uh, taken off to deliver uh, blood um, to to health facilities and and hospitals and you know saving lives of of, of uh, women given given birth and and others. So thanks for raising some of that. Uh, I know that Ghana has just taken off with a with a drone uh, system as well. But these are really advanced technology, and we know the context of several of these countries. And I, I think in terms of innovation, looking at the context looking, looking at the context will really be critical at the priorities within a government system. Um let me just pause and take a few comments from the chat box. Um I will encourage you to, to mute yourself uh if you're not speaking, um so we can have a good audio quality. So from the chat box we have uh Carolina. Uh, who talked about uh, South America and the fact that they have a lot of partnerships with universities um, in terms of um, enhancing and, and having strong uh, leadership and governance um, capacities. Uh, for example, she talked about advertising departments' um, involvement for the influenza season um, and uh, education also partnering in terms of checking vaccinations and, and promoting um, health, health issues. Um, so thanks so much, Carolina, for sharing that. We have another comment from Irene Ochala, uh, who talks about linking leadership to outcomes of a program, that it can be very challenging. And she, she's raising the issue of um, looking at some indicators uh, such as the ability of managers to set priorities and delegate. Uh, how can we ensure that this is uh, included as part of the, the metrics? And then I will take one more uh, from Meglor Achiri. Uh, and she talks about the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals and how that is uh, really ambitious and gender 
uh, to aggressively address the unfinished agenda of the MDGs. Uh, and she talked about the advancement of the private sector um, and that they are taking a more serious role and trying to align their corporate social responsibility better to match the, the SDGs. Thank you so much, Meglor, for, for sharing those thoughts with us. We're just about getting to the end of our panel uh, webinar today, and I wanted to wrap up with um, a last set of questions. And this, um, maybe we'll turn to uh, Professor uh, Pate um, to kick us off on this. And you, you know, we've talked a lot about different things from, from the challenges to the enablers and, you know, some very good examples. But what would you, what would you say are the strategies um, that we should scale now to address the most pressing health needs? We're already at the cusp of 2020 and beyond. So in your view, what are those top things that you, you, you would recommend should be scaled now to ensure that we are crossing the bridge to stronger leadership and, and governance. Um, Professor Pate. So that's a, a, quite a broad um, question. If you're asking what we should scale now in terms of leadership capabilities and competence, um, I, I think um, really that's, that, that, that's a very tough one. Um, Identifying young leaders within our health system at the country level and providing them opportunities to acquire those competencies that they did not have by default as they grew up within the health system would be first. Um, these are mid-level young uh, as well as upcoming uh, professionals. Um, beyond their technical competencies, these managerial and leadership competencies to, expo to, to expose them to that I think would be very um, valuable to append that to uh, existing institutions and bringing in capabilities from outside the continent where necessary or use as much as possible what is available in our countries would be um, very good. I, I think the, um, yeah, I think that's one area in terms of leadership competencies that are needed to improve our health systems on the continent to deliver on the UHC agenda, but also immunization as part of that. Then secondly, also to encourage the sort of uh, non-traditional health actors to uh, play a more constructive role in our health systems so that we have lots of people that are not, let's say, physicians or nurses or pharmacists, but they're either consumers or participants within the health ecosystem. and to, 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 for them to also sort of feel part of it and create the solutions ultimately, be it immunization or health service delivery or redesigning our health system or assessing quality or measuring it, uh, to, to be part of that I think would be a good uh, thing. That's where the innovations will come as well. Well, I made sure to ask you the very hard questions, uh, Professor Pate. So thank you very much. Um, I want to, you know, give um, Posse and Ranjana a chance to to share their uh, their, you know, their big recommendation or takeaway from, you know, um, or something they want to leave behind for us to to think about and continue to to take forward within the global space around uh, health leadership and governance. Uh, so I'm going to, you know, uh, ask uh, Ranjana, you know, in one minute, what would that be? Um, I think, again, a tough question, but um, uh, leaving, uh, you know, takeaway messages uh, really uh, to recognize that it's equally important to invest in leadership and management um, competencies uh, and not re restrict ourselves to only uh, technical competencies. The second area is invest in partnership because we have seen that uh, whether it's the public sector or whether it's the civil society, we just tend to work in our own universe. And I think um, if we all join hands together, 
uh, I think uh, we will really then be able to uh, meet the goals for the UHC. And again, the last my point is that you learn more from your own country rather than uh, cross continents or cross this thing. So identify those pockets, areas where really working, uh, you know, in the same country or same region and scale up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ranjana. Um, Posse, over to you. Uh, thank you. In addition to what my colleagues have said, I think I just want to agree with what they have said and just add on that we need to document the best practices uh, because out there, there are some uh, health managers who are doing a good job and we need to benchmark the good things they are doing and then uh, use them as, uh, as actually centers of excellence and uh, use them as uh, peer educators so that we, through the coaching and mentorship approach, as we had said earlier, we scale up these good practices and we should be able to create uh, peer groups for positive change so that the, the, these groups can uh, spread the good practices along the way uh, as a short-term measure, but also there is need for structured capacity building programs uh, which are in service in nature to capture the people who are already managing the health care to give them uh, good practices, what is recommended, and to make sure they move the health care forward, but also long-term to think of uh, uh, influencing the curriculum to input on uh, pre-service training to add on these components. I thank you. So I'd like to uh, thank our distinguished panelists today. Um, you've raised uh, uh, several important issues on on investing in, in leadership and, and governance, the efficiencies that that creates. I've talked about transformative leadership and speaking um, the, the different languages around finance, economics, and having the technical depth. Uh, we've talked about the use of innovations um, and the role of exchanging and partnering uh, with private sector and others. And we, we talked um, about accountability and, and having metrics around good leadership, good health governance, and how to build that uh, capacity uh, in, in the African uh, region. So I'd like to thank everyone that's been able to join the, the webinar today. It's been a fantastic um, uh, sharing and exchange, and a special thanks to our panelists, um, Dr. Pasi Mugenyi, Ranjana Kumar, and Muhammad Ali Pate. Uh, thank you for, to all those who were able to join us uh, online as, as well. Um, we'll be putting out um, 10 big takeaways from this webinar, so, so do look out for it. Uh, thank you so very much, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Perfect on time. Perfect.